Welcome to Washington Legal Foundation's webinar. My name is Glenn Lammy. I am Executive Director and, and Vice President for Legal Studies of Washington Legal Foundation. For those of you not familiar with the foundation, we're turning 46 years old this year. Um, we're in our middle ages, but uh, we're still very vibrant. Um, we're, we're involved in the courts and the regulatory agencies to try to advance a, a legal and regulatory structure that's favorable to free enterprise. So you'll see us often in the Supreme Court, you'll see us publishing publications on a pretty wide range of issues, um, putting on programs such as this one. Our, our website is wf.org, easy to remember. So if you want to check that out after the program is over or, or shoot me an email at glammy at wf.org if you have any questions about us, please, please feel free to do so. So our topic of discussion today is one that's really become evergreen and is an area of interest to the larger free enterprise community, regardless of type of industry, size of business, or geographic location. That a corporation located in Florida that does business primarily on the East Coast might want to know more about the new state attorney general of New Mexico or Arizona is really a testament to how these chief law enforcement officers have become highly relevant national figures and policymakers. It's also very telling that many national law firms have developed practice groups focused on state AGs. We're pleased to have with us today three attorneys from one of America's leading state AG practices to discuss the 16 new sheriffs in town and sketch out the landscape on which those officials and their fellow sitting AGs will operate. Glenn, thank you very much. One second, sorry. I'll introduce you guys. So we're joined today by Bernard Nash, who is a member of Cozen O'Connor, where he serves as co-chair of the state of, of, of the firm's state attorney's general practice area. He's cultivated a unsurpassed understanding of the state attorney's general world over in his during his 50 plus years of practice. Our second originally scheduled speaker, Mark, Milton Marquis, was called away in a client matter. And stepping in for him is Jerry Kilgore, and we really appreciate him doing that. Um, he's a member of Cozen O'Connor and previously served as Attorney General and Secretary of Public Safety for the Great Commonwealth of Virginia. During his service as AG, Jerry served as Chairman of the Republican State Attorneys General Association. And uh, third is Mira Bailson, who's a member of Cozen O'Connor, located in their Philadelphia office. She's a seasoned trial attorney with a broad knowledge of and familiarity with state AGs and other government agencies. I want to remind you that this is being recorded. Uh, there is a PDF of uh, the slides in the chat or a link to them. And if you have any questions, please uh, put them down in the Q&A tab, and we'll be uh, addressing those at the end of the program. Bernie, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to be with the Washington Legal Foundation. Uh, once again, uh, on behalf of the three of us, uh, you know, we, we thank you. You're always a pleasure um, to, uh, to work with. Uh, we hope to leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end uh, of, uh, of our presentation you know, for questions. And so uh, we look forward to having questions and we, we will try to be expeditious so we have enough time to answer questions. Uh, as Glenn said, you know, we're with the law firm of Cozen O'Connor. We have about 800 attorneys in, in 16 states. It's my privilege to co-chair the state attorney general uh, practice group within uh, Cozen. Uh, we have about 16 attorneys that do nothing but state attorney general work uh, throughout, uh, throughout the country. I have almost 50 years experience doing it. Jerry Kilgore is a, a bit younger. He has only 20 plus. And we have a, a, a group of uh, excellent litigators within our practice, including former chief deputies, former heads of, of, of uh, consumer protection, of anti, the antitrust unit, uh, et, et cetera. Um, before we turn you know, to discuss you know, each or, or many of the 16 newly elected AGs, I'd like to ask uh, Jerry to give us a few minutes first you know, on why state AGs uh, matter. Uh, so Jerry, if you'd kick us off with why do state AGs matter, if you think they do. Well, it's great to be with you all and great to talk about state AGs, a uh, position I held at, at one point in my career, but state AGs ma matter because they can affect through the courtroom, through this justice process, what uh, what sometimes we try to prevent in the boardroom. 
the state AGs can come in and, and change your business practices from using subpoenas and CIDs and things of that nature to force businesses, if you will, to, to do it the way they see that it ought to be done. You know, state AG serve as that chief law enforcement officer. They have that broad civil authority to investigate businesses. Most every state now has a, a UDAP, what we call a UDAP statute, which is the unfair and deceptive acts and practices uh, law that gives them very broad authority to go in and investigate businesses. Now, AGs may investigate businesses for a variety, variety of reasons. They may have received consumer complaints. They may have uh, heard from the trial lawyer community that something is going on. They may have heard from consumer groups or special interest groups or in partnership with some of the federal agencies like the CFPB and the FTC, they may be asked to join in a broader investigation into various companies. Uh, state AGs also have antitrust powers that they can go at it alone when a merger is announced or when a company they believe is apt, acting with uh, uh, you know, monopolistic powers, or they can go with their federal partners, whether it's the FTC or the other federal agencies that have authority in the antitrust arena. We're seeing a growing trend across the United States in privacy laws, where a lot of states are enacting privacy laws that protect consumers' privacy. You have the California model and you have what's called the Virginia model. The Virginia model and those that have come after the California model give state AGs the power to enforce the privacy acts of the consumers. Now, California did a little different as you expect California would do it. They gave consumers the right to go into court and sue in addition to state AGs and and others in California. So it's creating sort of a litigation, uh, a massive appeal there in California, but the Virginia model and others that have followed Colorado give that power to the state AG at the, at the forefront. So the state AG is in there enforcing privacy laws when, when maybe a breach occurs, a, a, an, an attack, a cyber attack occurs on your business, then you know, most privacy laws now require you to report it. And then the state AG immediately starts investigating. So you become a victim on one minute and then you're subject to a state AG investigation the very next minute. Uh, the AG, clearly every state AG interacts with their state agencies. Most of the time they are the legal, they are the lawyer for the state agencies and the, they, give legal advice to the governor and the legislature as well. So they have authority in that perspective as in setting state policy and setting state laws as well. I, but you know what we've seen over the past uh, 10 to 20 years is the huge increase of power in a state AG's office. They now weigh in regularly on, on federal issues, on, on cases at the U.S. Supreme Court cases at the circuit court level where they'll file amicus briefs and take a stand or they'll actually file suit and, and take a federal agency or others to court for that particular issue. The, being a statewide elected official, state AGs do occupy that bully pulpit within their state. So they hold a press conference about a business practice, about a particular industry, you know, the state media usually takes notice. And a lot of times, given what's going on nationally, we're in a 24 hour news cycle now, the national media takes notice of what the state AGs are doing. And, uh, you know, the, the 2023 political landscape changed a little bit. And Mira's going to talk a little bit about that as we get into talking about these new AGs. You know, having done this for more than you know 40 years it kind of brings back you know some some other additional thoughts uh jerry uh you know for example uh i've gotten to know you know a president of the united states because he was a former ag uh, a supreme court justice because he was a former ag and several states chief justices of the supreme court uh, because uh, they were uh, former AGs and, and more currently, 
you know, why should, you know, uh, companies get to know AGs? Because, you know, as of today, you know, there are seven sitting governors, seven sitting governors, you know, that's like 14% of the governors were former AGs. And there are seven sitting U.S. senators, you know, and at least a half dozen or more have retired. Well, uh, well we, right have now, to recognize, we have to recognize, Bernie, that m most people in the AG world consider AG to stand for aspiring governor. And, and that's, how you, <laughs> that's what you're seeing today. <laughs> so true. So true. And, and you mentioned, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, amicus brief, amicus briefs. Uh, you know, so just to bring to our audience's uh, attention, you know, the fact that, you know, although most of our clients and businesses see AGs as adversaries, AGs can be very supportive of your uh, policy and, and legal issues, you know, in the U.S. Supreme Court and in other courts. You know, for, you know, for example, AGs filed an amicus brief uh, in Concepcion in the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, supporting, you know, our client, you know, ATT in that matter. Uh, they supported another client of ours in Twombly, which, you know, radically changed the and lowered, I mean, and, and heightened uh, the pleading standard. I mean, so AGs, you know, matter, you know, for many, many reasons, you know, quite beyond the issue of the day. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I, as we went into the election season, I think we really saw that based on the amount of money and the amount of focus that was being given to the AG elections this year. Um, this was a huge year. There were 31 um, AG elections and going into the season, there were 27 Republicans and 24 Democratic AGs. Um, and of note of those 31 AG elections, 12 open seats were to be had. So that's where, you know, 12 seats where there was not an incumbent um, and it really was in some ways a bit of a free for all. Um, and you saw that a lot in the primaries leading up to those AG elections. They were very contested in certain states with as many as three or four different candidates vying for the position in the general election. Um, and, and while I'm sure almost everyone on this Zoom felt some form of election fatigue, um, it, it it's kind of, it's a little crazy to think that there was much discussion about what's going to happen. There's going to be a change in the composition of the AGs and, or, you know, maybe all red, many, many seats are going to flip. But in reality, we ended up basically with the exact same, well, probably I should say, with the exact same ratio of Republicans to Democratic AGs. Um, and uh, there was many predictions that there were going to be a number of seats that would flip from Democrat to Republican. But in the end, one state flipped from Democrat to Republican and one state flipped, well, as of right now, from Republican to Democrat. Um, so let's just take a second to to talk about those. But, you know, essentially they canceled each other out more or less. Um, Let me interrupt you, if I might, for, for a second. I like to kind of give, you know, uh, history lessons and civics uh, lessons. It, it is so true that every vote counts because what Mira alluded to about right now is in the state of Arizona, you know, uh, before the recount, which is now completed, you know, the Democratic candidate won by 510 votes. After the recount, you know, she still won, you know, but by 280 votes. And that is now being I would say challenged. I don't know what if it's an appeal or the, the no lawsuit, but it's being litigated in the courts. But out of two hundred two and a half million votes cast, the attorney general's race right now is that has been determined by two hundred and eighty votes. So I'm sure all of us vote all the time, but it's another reason why you know we're very fortunate to have the right to vote, and we should exercise that right. Amen. Well said. Um, and and as Bernie pointed out, you know, Arizona is still somewhat in flux, although uh, the Democrat Chris Mays was sworn into office and has taken that position, and, but there is outstanding litigation. So I don't want to wave that away. Certainly, along with the right to vote is our right to go to court to preserve our rights. So um, that is occurring as we speak. Besides Arizona, Iowa is the other state that I mentioned, and that flipped from a Democrat to a Republican. Um, the Democrat was the incumbent Tom Miller. And Tom was the longest serving attorney general in the country. He had been there for more than 40 years. Um, he was a real institution um, 
Iowa has been, you know, on a, a red trend, let's say, for many, many years. I think many people consider it to be almost an entirely Republican state. Um, the fact that uh, Tom Miller continued to win and continued to serve those people is really a testament to the type of person he is and the type of AG he was. Um, he was uh, finally uh, defeated by uh, Republican Brenna Byrd, um, who's a newcomer to the AG scene. Um, and we're going to go through what I'll call the new AG class in a few slides. So Jerry will have a second to talk a little bit more about her. But uh, yeah, thanks so much, Glenn. I just want to um, touch on a couple other states that, you know, many people, including people in our own practice, thought, you know, might flip, but ended up not. So Kansas, for example, is one that we really thought a Democrat might have a chance. I, I personally thought the Democrat might have a chance. Um, but in fact, it remained Republican. And uh, Chris... Kovach is the new attorney general, um, and Jerry's going to talk about him a little bit, and that's a name that is probably familiar to a number of you. Um, and then Minnesota is another one that we definitely thought was potentially going to turn red, um, but it remained Democratic. Um, Keith Ellison, who's the current, who was the current AG, was reelected for a second term, and those margins were also fairly slim in both uh, Minnesota and also in Wisconsin. So, um, it really was an exciting election season. Um, nothing panned out exactly as was expected. Um, and as you know, to Bernie's point, there really were some razor thin margins that decided who would be the new AG. Um, thanks, Glenn, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, I will say on that, Mira, that in the past, normally the AG race follows or tracks very closely with the top of the ticket, but we didn't see that this year. We saw some split tickets going on in, in a lot of states like Wisconsin and Michigan and other states where, where the AG was not running neck and neck with their governor or their U.S. senator and things. We had a U.S. senator elected as a Republican in Wisconsin, but yet the Democrat incumbent AG held on to, to his post. So the new Republican AGs uh, brought a variety of experience to the table from you know, prior military service to private legal practice to to prosecutorial and even being uh, business folks. Uh, Mike Hilgers from Nebraska, you know, started his own law firm and it's been consistently named one of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in the country. He's, he came to a lot of the meetings and talked about really his business background as the reason he got into the AG's race. He served as speaker in the Nebraska House uh, and was, uh, had that legislative experience as well. Now, Ginter Drummond came from, uh, of course, had to be a lawyer, but his his claim to fame in Oklahoma is that he has a a large business practice there. He uh, he created uh, Blue Sky Bank, which employs hundreds of folks there in Oklahoma. He he also founded Drummond Communications and owns his own ranching operation, and and he defeated an incumbent. Republican Attorney General in the primary to, to win that particular race. Uh, a lot of you may be familiar with the Kansas, new Kansas Attorney General. And this is another race where it did not track with the uh, gubernatorial race. The incumbent Democrat continued to win. She won Kansas in the governor's race, but Chris Kovac narrowly won the Attorney General's race. And he has a long history in, in the in media with his immigration stand and his interviews on, on news cycles like Fox News and, and Newsmax, where he uh, uh, takes a hardliner approach on immigration issue. You may remember him as the former Secretary of State of Kansas, and he also ran for governor in the last election against this incumbent governor that has now won our second race. Uh, Ray Will Labrador from Idaho, uh, some DC may recognize his name and that he was a former congressman and uh, uh, challenged a longtime incumbent in uh, Lawrence Wasden in Idaho in the Republican primary and won that race and then went on to win the general. Tim Griffin, is the, was the lieutenant governor of, of Arkansas, and he and the uh, current, the uh, now today is inauguration day in Arkansas, so I'm being careful here. He and the prior now aged attorney general, they switched spots, and she became the lieutenant governor, and Tim Griffin 
as now the Attorney General of uh, Arkansas, Marty Jackley in South Dakota came back. He had been the prior Attorney General. We worked well with him. He's a great Attorney General, very uh, much middle of the road, pro-business pro type of guy. And uh, he came back and won uh, an election to Attorney General after some issues had occurred with a prior AG. So that's the, the in Missouri now, uh, the reason we have, we didn't have an election for Attorney General of Missouri this year, but the uh, current Attorney General, Eric Schmidt, was elected to the United States Senate with that vacancy there. The governor appointed Andrew Bailey, who was a former, assistant, a former United States Attorney in Missouri that uh, under the Trump administration, and then the governor appointed Andrew Bailey to serve out the term of, of the existing Attorney General. Jerry, can I can I ask you a question? Um, in your experience, when there's a new a new AG of the same party as the last one, what kind of turnover do you expect to see in that office? Obviously, it's a little different when there's you know a Democrat coming in after a Republican, but you know, for example, in you know in Oklahoma or in Arkansas, what do you expect to see as far as you know the the AG staffers themselves? Well, from party to party, I do expect large. I do expect a, a different organizational change in Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Idaho. I think today we saw in Arkansas that he has named and reorganized the entire office and has named a lot of new people to the office that weren't there with the, the prior attorney general. Idaho is doing the same thing. He will name a lot of new people. Oklahoma, I believe, will do the same thing when he's uh, actually sworn in. Uh, of course, uh, Brenna Byrd was a change from a Democrat to a Republican, and you would expect more change there. And we got more change there, and that more than uh, around 20 folks were asked to not uh, return to the office. And she, uh, as is typical, you do want your own senior staff in place. Uh, and I always tell people that, you know, if you're going to be Attorney General, you need to take your own people in with you, no matter whether you're taking over from a Republican or a Democrat, because you need people that understand how you operate and what your goals are and what you want the office to do. You know, I find it interesting, Jerry, that, you know, there are, you know, eight new Republican AGs, you know, Marty Jackley of South Dakota, of course, is a newly elected AG, but he was a former AG as well. But out of the uh, eight uh, new, uh, new AGs, uh, you know, five uh, have, you know, previously you know, run for office, some statewide, some not statewide. And, and so uh, they've run for office in the past. Uh, and you have, you know, as you said, you know, Tim Griffin and, and Raul Labrador, former congressman, uh, ran for AG and, and, and won. Uh, and of course, there is, you know, on the Democratic side, Anthony Brown of Maryland, is a former congressman as well as a former lieutenant governor, as well as a former defeated candidate for governor. So, which, which you know shows that there's a lot of interest now in state attorneys general because you can actually get stuff done, unlike Washington, where maybe you can't get a lot done. <laughs> yeah, I mean totally. And and um, so what I see, what I see is a different trend, like from 20 years ago or so, where you saw uh, law professors run for AG, uh, distinguished you know, attorneys from large law firm run uh, for AG, and now, now there's, uh, there's a shift. I'm just observing it. So with Tim Griffin and Raul Labrador and Anthony Brown uh, having been elected, you know, uh, former congressmen, they're joining, you know, three former congressmen who are now sitting AGs as well. They're joining, you know, uh, Rokita Landry and, and Ellison, you know, two, two Republicans and a Democrat. So you'll now have, you know, six former members of Congress sitting as AGs. And I think that also, that's a trend. And I think it's also kind of indicative of the shifting policies and priorities that you see. Uh, in a number of offices, you know, given their strong, you know, political uh, background, legislative um, background. Um, on the Democratic, you know, side, you know, we have a number, we have, let's see, uh, three, we have eight, uh, eight new, new AGs. 
And of those eight new AGs, you know, I'll single out for the moment, you know, Brian Schwab of the District of Columbia. Uh, you know, he is the second elected AG of the District of Columbia. Uh, his predecessor, Carl Racine, was the first uh, elected AG who was elected for two terms. And each of them was a former managing partner of the Venerable Law Firm. It's almost like, you know, Venerable, you know, has, has some insight into the benefits of being AG of the District of Columbia. You know, so you have a, a, a real, a real lawyer and, and, and manager in, you know, in Brian Schwab. Uh, and then I, we already talked about, you know, Anthony Brown, or I did. Uh, but then we have, uh, of, the, of the remaining, we have uh, one, two, three, uh, who were also uh, former elected officials. Uh, you know, we have, you know, Chris Mays of Arizona, who, who uh, uh, was a member of the Corporation Commission. She ran then as a Republican and just shifted parties, I think, two or three years ago. But she has strong experience uh, as an elected official on the Corporation uh, Commission. Uh, we have uh, Andrea Campbell, who was uh, the first African-American elected uh, to the Boston City Council. And she served on the Boston uh, City Council. Uh, and you've got uh, Raul Torres, a district attorney uh, from, uh, from New Mexico. Um, so you have kind of, you know, people with, you know, with, with uh, strong uh, uh, political insight and, and instincts. And in, in addition to that, uh, we have three former uh, AG staff, uh, now AGs. Uh, Hawaii, you know, Ann Lopez uh, was a former special assistant to a former attorney general. And in Pennsylvania and Vermont, Pennsylvania, the chief deputy was appointed, you know, by the outgoing AG who became governor. So he appointed uh, her uh, as, uh, as AG. Uh, she will not run again. She made that, that pretty clear. Uh, and then the former chief deputy of Vermont, Charity Clark, ran uh, and, and, and won. So you have kind of diverse experiences, but the emphasis to me is you have a lot of people who run for office uh, running, uh, running again. And I think that indicates the kind of changes uh, that, we're gonna, that we're going to see. Um, Mira, tell us about some of the uh, idiosyncrasies, if I'm pronouncing it uh, uh, correct, that are in, in the age of the world. How many people like us who kind of track this uh, will even be aware of it? Yeah, thanks, Bernie. And, um, you know, we're going to head into the portion where we talk about key trends and what we're seeing in the enforcement, you know, in our tea leaves for the future year. But before we get into that, I just I want to provide sort of a primer on, on you know, what we see is the larger influences in AG enforcement um, around the nation. Um, so first, let's just briefly talk about multi-states or multi-state investigations and then litigation. Essentially, they're formed when generally or most typically you have a Republican and a Democratic-led state that come together um, to investigate a specific company or series of companies that are engaged in the same industry. Um, those, the Republican and the Democratic state, right, um, depending on what party the AG is, um, will form an executive committee that they attempt to traditionally have balanced with a number of Republican states and a number of Democratic states. Um, the idea here being is that the consumer protection, the antitrust beliefs are nonpartisan, right? The AGs are all trying to ensure that the consumer is not harmed. And that's generally what the purpose of a multi-state investigation is, to put their resources together to help the greatest number of consumers prevent the greatest amount of consumer harm. Um, the executive committee will then lead the investigation um, and, and either before there's a settlement or before there's litigation, they will circulate to other states to see if they'd like to join. Um, if there is a settlement or if there's a, a win after litigation, the percentage of the settlement will then be allocated based on the efforts that have been put in by the state and the footprint of that state. Um, the, the exact uh, formula in which it is allocated is a bit of the secret sauce. Um, 
there are no rules really, right? There's no guidebook. It's not like when the DOJ starts to prosecute a company and there's a manual you can look at that they they publish that the prosecutors are supposed to follow. It doesn't really exist in the AG world. And so there's the traditional way things are done. And there's also just what the staffers or the AGs that are making up these executive committees really want to have happen. Um, and it really can be a very fluid situation where you have an executive committee that's you know, being held hostage by some state that feels a very certain way about something, or you can have an executive committee that doesn't really care about the investigation. It goes on for, you know, 10 years or something. I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit, but truly it is a malleable idea. Um, and, and that's why, you know, often when companies find themselves in the crosshairs with a multi-state, you really need people who understand what the investigation could look like, what could happen with a multi-state, right? Because it's not like a DOJ investigation and it's not, it's not like a, a class action from plaintiff's lawsuits. It has a whole different character. Um, I'm going to pause for a second there. Um, I don't know if Bernie or Jerry wanted to add anything about that because multi-states is, you know, obviously a lot of what uh, we do in our practice, and and it certainly is an important way that states protect their consumers. I would say generally from a company's perspective, you should see this coming. Uh, you know, you would have already started working, receiving inquiries from AG's office, or maybe you already got a subpoena, and uh, maybe subpoenas start rolling in from a few states. And, and as Mira and Bernie know, these state consumer protection chiefs talk, they have a bi-weekly a conference call where they talk about specific cases they are they are investigating or companies they are investigating and you know if it gets to where a lot of states are investigating the same type of activity in a company then that's usually leads to a multi-state formation and i would say believe it or not oftentimes the front office me the attorney general the chief deputy the deputy to the chief deputy you know the front office staff uh, uh, oftentimes and shockingly have no idea that they are in a multi-state. Uh, and that's being changed in some states, but not, not, uh, not in others. Um, and you know, I, I, based on my experience, I find that there really are, you know, two, typically two, sometimes three leading states, even if the exec executive committee is bipartisan and consists of 10 that are running the show. And even though there might be 30 or 40 states in it, you know, three quarters of the other 20 or 30 have no idea. They may get a memo a week, a memo a month. They may not get any memo unless they call and ask about it. They have no idea what's going on, but the decisions are made by a, a handful. And when it formulates into the companies don't want to settle, so we're going to litigate the other states, whether they know anything about it or not, just pretty routinely join. And if there's a settlement that's proposed, that typically happens, you know, which is why it's critical to really understand who's running the multi-state, not just which states sign the subpoena or sign the demand letter or whatever, but who's really running it, why, you know, who do you really need to talk to to get your point of view across? And it's not satisfactory just to send them a counter proposal, another counter proposal. You really got to get in there, you know, and press the weaknesses uh, of their arguments. And so some of the other states otherwise just might be me too, start to ask, uh, ask questions of, about the allegations and about the, uh, uh, the defenses. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I mean, that really well illustrates, you know, the, the different dangers that come with a multi-state. I have seen multi-states be successful, though, in terms of uh, a, a business's perspective in that it gets everyone in the same room, right? And you can get lasting peace, um, which sometimes can be the best uh, outcome. But obviously, each multi-state is a little different. It really depends who's running it. Um, yeah, and I, for that reason, although it seems counterintuitive, you know, typically you'd want to say, well, let's limit let's keep states off it at a certain point in time once you see which states are really in it and who's not oftentimes it's in your client's best interest to talk to state ag a b and c and say you know hey you know this has significant impact on your state it has significant impact on our company we think it's a little unbalanced and a little biased in terms of who's in there you know would you mind joining the multi-state just so you'll learn the issue 
at a high level uh, and create some balance, you know, and, and fairness. So again, it's counterintuitive, but I'd say frequently we ask, you know, certain states, would you join that just so, you know, we'll have the ability of people on the inside to, if they agree with our position, to advocate it. Yeah. Um, the next the next point I want to make is about the alliance between the plaintiffs bar and state AG offices. Uh, Jerry mentioned this before about you know why why a state AG might start focusing on a company. Certainly, there is a bit of an alliance there. Um, there are offices, and they're on both sides of the aisle that regularly utilize outside counsel um, in investigations and litigations, um, and those operate on a contingency basis. And I'm sure everyone on the Zoom is aware of the dangers that come from that type of um, uh, uh, arrangement. Um, in addition, there are um, there's sort of a synchronicity between the plaintiffs bar and the consumer protection folks because you know at base level, the idea is they're both protecting the consumers. They're both trying to you know protect the little guy, as it were. Um, I, I wouldn't call this alliance nefarious. That's the wrong word to use for it. But there's certainly it's certainly different than um, what you'll see in other types of investigations. I'll go back to the DOJ. You know, often you don't see the plaintiffs bar sort of whispering in a federal prosecutor's ear. Um, and depending on the office, um, you know, it's certainly something to consider when you're strategizing about how to respond appropriately, what are the right steps to take to, to block further investigation or potential litigation, and who the players are that are sort of creating this focus on your company. Um, and I think we saw a lot of that during the, the start of the opioid cases, you know, whether they were against the manufacturers, the distributors, or the pharmacies, or the doctors, we saw a lot of the trial bar in this thing with AG offices trying to force them to get involved in investigating these, these various activities. Absolutely. And, you know, that leads perfectly into the last point, which is conflicts related to litigation and what we'll call activism from other state-based entities like counties and municipalities. And we see this really clearly with the opioid um, litigation. And, you know, I'm, I sit in Philadelphia. It's still going on here in this Commonwealth. Um, there are, you know, who has the right to sue or litigate on behalf of the people of the Commonwealth. Um, you know, it, it's a very challenging environment, particularly for businesses who are thinking, okay, well, the AG is the one I need to focus on. And then here comes this municipality represented by a plaintiff's firm. And, you know, it, it, it is not fair, in my opinion, to have um, multiple government entities saying that they're representing basically the same people. Um, and I think you're going to, you know, at some point as this builds and builds, you're going to see, you know, there's going to have to be some sort of reform around it, legislative reform around it, because it really is an untenable situation um, for many for many businesses and, and also for AG offices. I mean, I think it really diverts their um, their resources if they have to fight against municipalities and counties, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, to, to really enforce their power as the chief law enforcement officer of a state. Um, so I, we're going to be seeing that, I think, a lot more, but that's definitely another little, you know, quirk as it were to the AG specific enforcement. And I think I think you see the conflict when you get down to talking settlement or trying to resolve a case where the plaintiffs bar, they want the money, whereas the attorney general may want changes in business practices, you know, more going to consumers and in notifications and, and labeling and things of that nature. But that usually doesn't interest the plaintiffs bar for some reason. For some reason. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Bernie, did you have anything to add on that? No, I think you're, you're seeing a, 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 a trend in many states of, of AGs and the business community aligning to support legislation, kind of reining in and limiting, uh, you know, who can represent the state, who can re represent you know, the people of the cities, you know, if the AG is already uh, in a case or, or wants to be in a case. So you're seeing this kind of hash out in different ways and different states and i think that's going to have several years yet to run until it until it uh, until it shakes out and it makes it very difficult to settle because a company wants to know i'm going to pay a dollar or you know a million dollars a billion dollars whatever it is in their own head there's a number that they're willing to settle for and you can talk to the ags there are 50 of them but you get the cities and states and, and, and municipalities involved you know each state you know has as scores, if not hundreds, of cities and municipalities. So it makes it very, very difficult. And at the end of the day, 
in my mind, there's an extortion uh, game going on, you know, from the cities and municipalities through their outside councils, squeeze out another $100 million in legal fees. And the money does not go to consumers, it goes to the lawyers. Tell us how you really feel. No, I'm <laughs> Bernie, do you want to do you want to talk? I'm on, I'm on tape. So everybody can listen to this <laughs> their time. I mean, I've lived it, so I see it. I see when we have a deal and then we don't have a deal. And I know why we don't have the deal until we fork over the, the incremental amount, whatever it may be. Um, are we shifting now to key trends? Or I, I kind of lost track of where, where we are, honestly. You're right, key trends. All right, so, you know, you know, key trends. You know, in general, you know, this election cycle will not really, you know, change the overall trend of aging enforcement and policy uh, priorities. It will change it in some states, you know, where the office uh, changed from party to party and even where the same party controls it. Uh, but that's kind of, you know, where a state will wind up. But in general, it's not gonna change uh, where it's going on. I think the major changes you'll see in the state will be probably in Iowa, Arizona, uh, you know, and uh, in Idaho. Um, I think well, there'll be a one-off change kind of in Oklahoma, not with respect to national issues, but the priorities of the newly elected Oklahoma AG are very different from the prior administration. He's going to be focusing on kind of making peace uh, with the tribes in Oklahoma so they can kind of be, you know, more copacetic uh, governance. Uh, he's also concerned about local corruption and believes the prior administration didn't focus enough on local corruption. So he's already kind of announced, you know, it, it, two of his three or four major initiatives will, will be developing uh, you know, positive relationships and governance relationships with the tribes, uh, as well as uh, honing in on local um, corruption. I think the other change you might See, you know, oftentimes uh, multi-states are bipartisan. I think that will continue, but for certain kinds of cases, there were typically, you know, Republican states like Tennessee, Idaho, and Nebraska joined some of the, um, a lot of consumer protection in similar type cases that surprised the business community. And I think with the newly elected AGs in those states, I think, you may see a, you may see the uh, uh, cutback in the number of, of multi states that those three states, uh, three Republican states, join. But in general, I, I don't think the election is going to change very much. You know where the priorities have been and where they're going to continue. Um, so that's from an, from an overarching point of view. That, that's what I see. Um, but, you know, again, as we've discussed, you know, we still want to talk a little bit about the trends within each of these buckets, let's call them. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and so consumer protection, you know, I'm just going to, I've mentioned it again, this is an evergreen area of interest for the AGs. Um, and in general, I think we're going to see um, in many of the offices, sort of business as usual around this area, um, common areas of interest are the deception and misrepresentation and advertisements and, you know, Industries that are a focus are auto industries, big tech, pharmaceuticals. Um, I don't. We don't see any reason that that's not going to continue. You know, uh, companies that engage in you know, quote unquote, the gig economy is going to continue. Um, but we do expect to see a significant investigation into privacy and data protection. Um, you know, as Jerry referenced with regards to the Virginia and the California model, uh, you know, companies are going to increasingly, in you know, Colorado, companies are going to increasingly have to put forth sort of like a patchwork, right? That's what I'll call it of privacy uh, privacy requirements that uh, fulfill almost every state's legal uh, regime, right? And inevitably there are gonna be some areas that they're just not hitting correctly or that it's trial and error. Um, and you can imagine that um, states are going to be watching um, to ensure compliance. Um, I think privacy is something that's, a, it's like a buzzword, like public safety, right? No one, no one who's elected official doesn't like to say that they're protecting your privacy. Every, every um, citizen likes to hear that. So I think that it's certainly something that they're going to lean into. Um, to the extent that big tech 
is still an area, um, both sides of the aisle are really focused on it. Um, and it is sort of an interesting place where you do see sort of multi-states coalesce, right? Um, we're gonna see, I think within that, a, a big collect, a big focus on the collection of data, which goes to privacy, but also the use of algorithms. Like for example, Texas has recently sued Google most recently for collecting biometric data without permission. Um, at the same time, AG Bonta in California just announced that his office is looking into the way algorithms used in healthcare industry are contributing to racial and ethnic disparities, right? So on the one hand, you see something that's very traditionally conservative, right? Your privacy, you know, stay away from my data. On the other hand, you see something that's very traditionally Democrat, you know, how is the data being manipulated to affect you know, specific, you know, uh, groups that have been marginalized. It's kind of like two sides of the same coin. They're both going after the same people for the same reasons, but with different, um, you know, different uh, arguments behind them. Um, and I think, you know, really the AGs have so many different weapons in their toolbox to use, tools in their toolbox to use to get companies um, in enforcement actions. And, and um, consumer protection, it could be misrepresentation it could be deception it could be false advertising i mean there's so many things and and so you really got to you know watch your p's and q's um and it's almost like a strict liability circumstance right um and and that's one of the reasons why you know when we're advising businesses particularly those in what we'll call areas of industry that are under the microscope really it's about getting out there and sort of making sure the ags know that you're trying the best you can Right, that you are doing everything you can to comply with the law. And so if there is a mistake, if there is an error, you know, they're not going to shoot out a subpoena. They're going to pick up the phone call, make a call. And Jerry, Bernie, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add about consumer protection specifically. No, I'll, I'll let that go in the interest of time because I see it's ah, one, yeah, sorry about that. No, no problem at all. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch upon antitrust. I'll try to do it in an abbreviated, you know, way. I think you know, antitrust um, is going to continue as a high priority. You're seeing it in, at the federal level, uh, the Federal Trade Commission particularly. Um, I think that um, the FTC just came out, you know, with a, a rulemaking. Uh, we'll see if that has, has legs. I know they're going to promulgate the rule, but we'll see if the courts agree they have the authority to promulgate it with respect to anti-poaching and non-competition agreements, although the states have been ahead of them, they've been doing that through state investigations and, and consent decrees and four states, California, North Dakota, Oklahoma, and DC have already, you know, passed statutes with respect to non-compete, you know, agreements. I think the priority is going to continue to be on tech, you know, healthcare, you know, and, uh, and, and pharma, uh, tech in particular, because everybody is saying everybody was asleep at the switch. That's why Google became what Google is. That's why Microsoft became Microsoft, Facebook, now Meta, uh, Amazon, you know, because small mergers were overlooked and that allowed them to become, you know, what at least a lot of antitrust forces, you know, believe is an unhealthy situation. Uh, so I think what used to be viewed as small mergers now are going to be looked at microscopically uh, and, and attacked or opposed, just like DOJ um, is now, uh, excuse me, the FTC, you know, is now seeking to block the Microsoft Activision uh, acquisition, which is going to be going to be litigated. Um, so I think I'll just stop there so we can move on to ESG, which is very, very important. Oh, uh, Mira, did you want to cover oh, just a lot really, of the CFPB real quick? I'll give one minute. Really briefly, uh, I'm sure everyone on this webinar knows about the AMG Capital case, which, you know, prevented the FTC from utilizing what had largely used um, uh, 13B powers to seek monetary relief on behalf of consumers. As a result, the FTC and the CFPB are really making efforts to work with states to bring them in because the states are able to get money to consumers as part of their, their state-specific power. Um, and we've seen several settlements where the FTC has joined with the states in the last year, not necessarily along partisan lines. And I think we're going to see that accelerate in 2023, but but also around the ESG topic. So, Jerry, I, I hope you could, you know, break this down a little bit for us. because Absolutely. I know it's, it's, ESG is going to be a very hot topic in the coming year or two in, in state AG work. 
world. I mean, certainly it stands for environmental, social, and uh, governance policies that most of the time investment firms are asking companies to, to institute so that they will then invest in that particular company. You have state AGs uh, on both sides. You have the Democrats generally supporting uh, the use of ESG policies for, for uh, the large companies. You have Republicans saying that, uh, you know, companies that do this or, or these, uh, these investment funds that are forcing this are causing companies to violate their fiduciary duties to their shareholders, which is to make a profit and that you shouldn't be telling private business, that is uh, the Black Rocks of the world and others should not be telling private business uh, where to invest and where not to invest. Uh, we're going to see a lot of, of uh, litigation on this issue, I think, by the state AGs. You're going to see a lot of, uh, of uh, states, red states particularly, have already started uh, saying to particular investment companies that if you require ESG policies as part of your investment portfolio, then we, you cannot, you cannot do business with the state. I know West Virginia has done that. I think Missouri is on the way to doing that. And many other states are, are considering that. And I think legis as legislatures are coming back, particularly in red states, they are going to be filing lots of ESG bills as, as we go forward. We, we saw this come to fruition at the latest NAG meeting when you had the Tennessee Attorney General, the new, uh, new newly appointed Tennessee Attorney General, John Scrimetti was on a panel with the outgoing DC Attorney General, Carl Racine. And, it was a little heated at times, I, I would say the discussion was, but, uh, you know, I think what we saw from the audience is that a lot of times the, the folks are talking past each other and there's not a clear definition of what the ESG policies actually are and if companies are instituting them on their own or are they being forced to institute these ESG policies and uh, I think that's a lot to be seen during these types of investigations as they gather evidence and, and get beyond it to see if there's business reasons. There could very well be good business reasons for, for um, ESG policies. Yeah, I, I think you're going to see uh, a, a lot more uh, litigation in that area with uh, certain AGs filing more and more challenges to various federal regulatory agency adoption of rules uh, in that space. Um, I, you're going to see you know, more AG focus on some of the proxy advisory firms and, uh, and the investment bankers with respect to how they vote, why they vote certain ways, whether there's a concentration of control you know, in the voting, so I think uh, that is that issue is in its infancy, really, with respect to where the law is going to go and the political challenges are going to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, with respect to the final slide, I think you've heard a lot about this. You know, as we talk about everything, you know. Uh, most businesses view AGs as their, as their enemy, or not enemy, really, but adversary. But I think, as you heard, they can really be businesses advocate against other businesses that are using unfair uh, practices in, in certain industries, uh, against the federal government and, and agencies, uh, and on uh, really important uh, legal issues you know, in, various, in various courts. Um, I think it's important that uh, businesses maintain good relationships with AGs, even if an AG is wrong on what it is investigating or how it's handling something, because AGs are, and, and particularly the career staff are, are there forever, and businesses need to exist and coexist, and you don't want to be uh, constantly and continually targeted. And I'm not saying you should surrender, but there's a way, a proper way to defend yourself in a very, very zealously, uh, and AGDC uh, can respect that. I, I think it's important to get in there early, to have your side of it known, because even if an AG is not going to drop a matter, you know, if he reduces the scope of what he's looking at and what he's demanding, you know, by 50%, that saves you a, a tremendous amount of money 
uh, and, uh, and time. And oftentimes, if it's a, a kind of a small thing that they want change, even though you can win the case in court and your law firms, including ours, sometimes will say, you know, we're 95% sure we're gonna win. Yeah, it'll take three years, it'll take a million dollars or a hundred thousand, whatever the dollar amount is. Oftentimes, you know, the, the wiser decision is to get a good settlement if you can. And oftentimes, if it's a high profile matter, uh, over time, your boards of directors will demand that because they're going to be sick and tired of seeing the company, you know, being, you know, the reputation of the company being damaged on the front page of the local newspapers or the Wall Street Journal or the columnists, you know, etc. So uh, there's a lot involved with respect to not just are we right, but what, the, what price are we going to have to pay uh, to prove we're right and is there a better, uh, a better outcome. And in order to achieve that, you have to know the AGs, you have to have your allies within the AG community so your side of it can be you know, properly advocated you know, in the inner sanctums you know, when it's the AGs alone talking about what they want uh, to do. I'm going to stop there in the interest of time. Uh, Jerry, you want to add something to that? No, I, I know there are times when companies go like, "We're we're going to fight this. We're going to fight this to the end." But you know, rarely do I see an AG, the a state attorney general's office, that really wants to litigate the matter. They they want to get to some type of resolution. And my advice to clients is always, "What does I know? It's not comfortable to be in this situation, but where can we go that's not going to be that damaging to the company and continue to." to make a profit and, and move on with these particular changes. Well, I think we're gonna stop there and we do have six minutes left for questions if there are any, any questions. So far, we don't have any from online viewers and I encourage you to, to definitely do that, but I, I guess I'll, I'll invoke my, my uh, moderator privilege and, and ask one. With regards to the FTC's non-compete proposal, um, WLS putting out a paper a couple of days talking about the fact that for two over 200 years, this has been a matter of state law. Um, do you expect state, state attorney general to weigh in with the FTC? Do you expect businesses to try to marshal the support of even some, some uh, more progressive state AGs to say, this is a state matter, let's, let's, let's keep it there? It's a very interesting question. I, I'm fairly confident that there will be a number of Republicans AGs that uh, take appropriate legal action based upon what you said, there really also should be some Democrats as well. You know, I don't, I, I'm known for saying what I think, you know, I mean, Delaware, you know, is the, is the state, you know, of, uh, uh, you know, which created, you know, the state's rights to oversee, you know, corporations. Uh, and and uh, with, a, with a great chancery court. Um, and so Delaware, you know, should be all over this. And I'm not trying to put my good friend, the attorney general on the spot. You know, and I think North Carolina is a, a second state where you have the development of a lot of state law with respect to, uh, you, know, you know, corporate uh, practices and activities. So I think there should be a couple of, Democratic states, but as a, as a political matter, I don't know if that's going to happen. So we do have a question from an online viewer. What is the best way to approach a new attorney general to let them know about the company? Well, it's, it, you want to make sure that you get to know your AG. We always say that you need to know your AG before you need your AG. And it's important to go ahead and either go to an event, you know the attorney general is going to be attending, and make the introduction. And usually that will lead to a, we want to come by your office and, and make a presentation, or you invite them to your company for a special event. You know, AGs like to do ribbon cuttings. They like to be there when you're making a big announcement. So, you know, invite them to come visit and get a tour of your facilities. Yeah, AGs are far more approachable uh, than the business community, you know, believes. I mean, it's better to use somebody who knows them, but if not, if you're a large company within the state, you know, you're the general counsel, you know, you put up a call saying, I'm GCX, you know, and I'd like to come at his or her convenience and, and talk and talk about my company, what we do, the jobs we bring to the state, the taxes we pay in the state. And uh, uh, I'm not aware of any AG that would 
uh, decline that. Right. Another online viewer question, any suggestions when the Attorney General's office's position seems to be at odds with the regulator of the same state, such as the insurance department? How can you reconcile them? Sometimes we they are of different parties. We see this all the time. And, and the point is you have to, Amir and I have done this in, in an ongoing case right now. We, we have to get those two agencies together, the Attorney General and the actual department had to get those together. Sometimes the AG represents and provides the legal advice to the to the agency. Other states, it doesn't happen that way. They have their own queue of lawyers in the particular agency. So we have to get everyone on the same page for the best decision for the state. Uh, sometimes that's easy and sometimes that's very difficult. Uh, I, I find that it's best if you can't work it out at the staff level by talking to each separately, having them talk to each other. Oftentimes because they're kind of bureaucratic or careers, they have their own vested interest in not looking at the bigger picture. You know, we try to make a presentation to the AG and say, would you call the Commissioner of Revenue or the Commissioner of, of, of Insurance? This is what they're saying, you know, and maybe, you know, we're looking for some common ground here. One more quick question and then we'll wrap up. Um, the role of state solicitors generals seems to have grown over the years, and, and there's some very prominent, very well uh, credentialed attorneys that, that are now um, in that office in, in a number of states. Any thoughts on sort of where they fit in, especially in the, in the amicus brief and, and the representation of the state in, in matters against the federal government? Other than AG, it's probably the most sought after position in that office. Uh, mainly because it puts you right in the middle of arguing in the Court of Appeals and, and most likely the U.S. Supreme Court during your term. There, you are a leader on all the legal issues that are sort of external to the office and you know, where it's affecting the business community, the criminal justice issues. All down the line, the Solicitor General runs the appeals in that office and, and it's a well sought after case. I know when I was doing the Virginia a transition last year, we had more applicants for the Solicitor General's team than any other position in that office. I think you're going to see people who are SG, you know, potentially moving into the role of AG. Um, I know Jerry has to run, but Thank uh, you, Jerry. I, think, I think you're going to see a bit of a transition there. I believe that uh, in Louisiana, where the AG has um, already announced that he's running for governor, I believe that his Solicitor General has also announced that she will be running for AG. Um, I don't think I'm letting the cat out of the bag with that. So um, <clears throat> I think that it's, it's you know, another stepping stone that some people see as the way to, you know, uh, really get things done, as it were. The AGs tend to listen to their SGs. And if you want an AG to do something, you know, as an amicus, particularly in the Supreme Court, if the SG says no, you have a real, uh, a real stumbling block in, in your way because they respect and value the SG. By the same token, oftentimes now it's not necessary to go to the AG to make a pitch for an amicus brief or something. You go to the SG, persuade the SG, and invariably the AG uh, follows the advice of the SG. So from our perspective, we sort of have you know, two roads into the objective we're trying to achieve for our clients. I think we'll finish it up there since we're a little bit after our time. Thank you very much to both of you and, and to Cozen O'Connor for your participation in this today. Uh, it's the second program that, that you all have done with us and, and we really appreciate uh, your volunteering your, your time to do this. Hopefully our, our attendees had a, a, a good opportunity to, to learn from what you all had to say. And uh, if those of you who are still on uh, came on late or have anyone that you know may want to watch it, it'll be available as an on-demand file uh, later in the day today on WLF's website. Again, thank you very much. It's been our pleasure, thank you.